Thank you, Jim. Presentation I'm giving today, this is the only time I get to give it here. It's only here in San Francisco. I'm not giving it in Los Angeles or in Seattle. So today, you're, it's probably my presentation, although we have a common presentation, I'm probably going to be talking more about from the practicing side. Rather, John, with John Stewart, we'll probably be talking more from the academic side. So, you know, I think, you know, you decide who gets the better deal. <laughs> but anyway. This is the deal. <laughs> okay. So, so, you know, uh, Farzad actually covered part of the presentation when he started talking about the overall overview of social structure interaction. I'm probably not going to spend as much time on that because I think the first part is the most important, dealing with brown motions. Uh, the outline is given here. The first part is on the ground motions. And needless to say, any of you that have been involved in performance-based design know that the ground motions really are the most important thing in the entire design because it drives everything. It drives the forces, it drives the displacements, it drives you crazy. <laughs> and you know, and uh, you know, recent developments in the code, you know that every all the force levels are going up. You know, you can thank a few people in the room. I won't, won't point out who they are, but you know, they gave you a 20 to 30 percent increase in ASC 710, and then you know who knows what else is coming in the next ASC 716. Well, we sort of know, but uh, you won't like it. Okay, all right. I need to follow my crib notes because I got in order to stay on time. So we'll cover ground motions. Then uh, I'll try my best to do soil structure interaction. Okay, so first we'll cover. Con some conceptual issues in dealing with ground motions and the role that it has in performance-based design. We'll look, talk, look at the terms, so this is more like background. And then uh, what's coming up, uh, as far as I talked about, uh, uh, conditional mean spectra and, and there's also conditional spectra. And that's, uh, that's being accepted now in the current documents and probably is going to be maybe more formalized in future documents that uh, like NEHER and perhaps ASC 7. So what, ground motions. Performance-based design, as Ron had mentioned, is really a comparison of the capacity versus the demand. And far as I talked about how it's being dealt with in the various documents. But basically, you have to have sufficient capacity for the demands. This is something that's not so clear when we're doing a code approach, whether you have that or not, because it's kind of prescribed that here are your force, here are your forces, and you know, based upon, you know, going to uh, a table or a map or the USGS website, and, and then you get something, and you know, it's a black box now. So you know, so you know, uh, can we sue the USGS for uh, for negligence? I don't know. I, I kind of doubt it. But, you know, but the ground motions are the, de they represent the demand. And uh, in the, in the uh, tall buildings procedures, both the LA and Pier, they give you a pretty good idea of how to get the capacities. And the capacities, you know, concrete is concrete, steel is steel. You know, you have published values, and these have been pretty well researched. But it returns to ground motions. Ground motions is this big kind of big question mark. And generally the way that we present ground motions is in terms of uh, the pseudo-spectral acceleration in one form and then another form, particularly since we have to do nonlinear dynamic analysis, we have to produce time series that are compatible with uh, those spectral accelerations. So the, the, uh, as far as I mentioned, the objectives of performance-based design usually involve checking for collapse prevention, which is our uh, MCER level, and the serviceability, the SLE, which is the uh, more frequent 43-year event. So as I already mentioned here, these are the two, the two conditions that we have to have. And then some jurisdictions, like San, as far as I mentioned, in San Diego, 
require evaluation of the design earthquake. You, you still have to do that. Now, where do we start? You know, uh, I'm sure you've probably seen this presentation a thousand times before, going back 10, 15 years. You know, how do we come up with the ground motions? First, we have to have an earthquake rupture forecast model. This is uh, the USURF 3, the latest, latest edition, which they uh, identify all the, all the sources for seismic activity. They also define, uh, de define the uh, rates, slip rates. And from this, you know, we use this as a basis for understanding where our ground motions are going to come from. And then the next step is we need to have, how do we, knowing where all these faults are, how do we come up with ground motions for design? Well, we have ground motion prediction equations. And these ground motion prediction equations here, uh, like for PGA, you can see that uh, as a function of distance, for given magnitudes, you get a, we, we can predict a certain value. And then also uh, some ground motion, we also have a, ground motion prediction equations that also give you the result at various spectral at, the, at different periods, yeah, not periods, different, yeah, different periods, uh, structural periods. So you can see here, there's a variation in the results. So these ground motion prediction equations now here in California, now we just have introduced, if you have your, your, your latest August issue of uh, the ERI, the earthquake spectra, you know that NGA West 2 is now out, out on the street. And I think that we're, we're beginning to use that now. The implementation will probably roll out maybe gradually. Uh, I guess we're still, you know, waiting for some agencies to accept it. But, uh, you know, West 1 versus West 2, there are some differences in the results. And, uh, you know, you ask any of the uh, researchers, they'll tell you what, you know, of course, they did it. They say West 2 is better than West 1 because it's based on more data. It covers, you know, more earthquakes, more records, and a wider range of, uh, of magnitudes. But, you know, a lot of that extra database also includes lower magnitudes. So now, you know, part of the reason that uh, they did NGA West 2 was also, you know, not just because of the additional data, but because people in places like low seismicity, like in Europe, were using NGA West 1, and they were coming up with what they thought were ridiculously high predictions of ground motion values for lower magnitude events, or where they have lower seismicity. So, you know, that's probably one area that's the biggest improvement. So from that, we can take all this and then uh, take the take the PGA, take the various periods, and then we can uh, get uh, the, do a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. And from that, we can get a, uh, here, uh, this scale, this is the, uh, the rate, rate and time that, uh, well, it's sort of like your recurrence rate versus the in intensity measure, which can be PGA, can be any period, any, uh, spectral acceleration any period. From that, uh, we can get a relationship. And generally, you know, we have, if you have a high rate of exceedance, you get lower ground, you get a weak ground motion, a high, a, a low rate of exceedance, you get strong ground motions, which, you know, that's, that's logical. And then from that, I'm sorry I'm rushing because I've got, as far as I told me, I have more slides than I need for two hours. But from this, we can uh, develop a uh, uniform hazard spectrum. You know, we do this for a specified hazard level. Here, example here, we, we're just showing 10% in 50 years. This is not the level that we generally use for design anymore. This is an old, old one. But, uh, but then from that, uh, we can, uh, here you see four different curves, one for PGA, one for spectral acceleration at short period, one at one second, and one at three seconds. So from that, we can get out these values, and then we can plot them versus period, and, f and then get a uniform hazard spectrum. Now, the uniform hazard spectrum represents a spectrum that we would expect, you know, with the ground motions would have a 10% probability of being exceeded. 
Now, it doesn't represent a single event necessarily. It represents the whole spectrum of all possible events, which will give you 10% exceedance in 50 years. Now, this might be the spectrum is, is really due to contributions from many earthquakes. And probably, you know, if you're looking at a place, well, maybe San Francisco is not a good place to take an example, but you take an example like down in Los Angeles. Los Angeles has a lot of local faults, but they're not, they don't have as high magnitude events possible. But then we also have the San Andreas Fault, which is 35 to 40 miles away from downtown Los Angeles. And if you're looking at the deaggregations, you see that at short periods, the, the hazard is really governed by the local events, which you know might give you magnitude 6, magnitude 7. But the, the long period events, the long period ground motions, when we're out there at 5, 6, 10 seconds, it's going to be governed by the big event on the San Andreas Fault. And, you know, and then the, it's, it's a big difference. So it's, it's not coming from one event. So the problem with uniform hazard spectrum is it's representing everything. And so if we're going to, and we've been using this for design, so you're really designing for a whole suite of things. And when it comes to the next step, if we're going beyond spectral analysis, we're going to time history analysis, trying to get time histories to, fo to force fit into the uniform hazard spectrum is not an easy thing because now you're creating a monster of a time history to try to make it do all things for all men. So it's extremely conservative. Okay, now we do have the concept of a deterministic cap in the Western United States. Uh, it's, in the, it's in ASC 7, uh, but you know, it really affects us here mostly in the Western states. The deterministic cap said that is uh, we look at the all the local f look at all the faults that are capable of producing active uh, active faults that are capable of producing ground motions and then we would look at what is the maximum what is the ground motion it can produce and in the code i think now we're limiting it to uh, mean plus one standard deviation 84 percentile ground motion that the hazard the uniform ha the hazard spectrum can be lowered if we if the probabilistic hazard spectrum shows that it's higher. So we can drop it. So in that sense, you know, what you might end up with not, is not necessarily a uniform hazard that it may be represent, you know, actually may have a little bit more higher hazard in that technical sense. Okay, now, thank, thanks to, our, thanks to uh, our friend in the back row there and some others, we have risk-targeted ground motions, which are based on consequential analysis. And the concept now is when we're looking at a uniform hazard spectrum, you know, you, so in some places you might get the same result, you know, get the same spectral acceleration at a certain period, but, but does that really represent what the true, the true risk to that structure is? You know, like you might get the same value in St. Louis as you might in San Francisco for a long period, but the thing is, you know, you're looking at here in San Francisco, we might see that event much more often than you would in St. Louis. So, given, given that, you know, it's now you're looking at, now we have to look a little bit at, okay, what is the vulnerability of those buildings? And this gets into stuff that uh, I don't truly, totally understand, but because it's a black box to me. But you know, it's a concept of using fragility curves and marrying it with the hazard curves, and trying to come and coming up with an estimate of the probability of collapse. So the fragility curves, and here it's a the top part here this is the probability of collapse uh, for a given. In intensity measured, like PGA or some spectral acceleration. And then here is the, the, uh, the rate, the ra uh, recurrence rate of the, uh, of the intensity measured versus the intensity. You see that uh, for a low intensity measure, like a low PGA, you get a higher rate of recurrence. For a, for a, uh, say, a high, inten a high intensity measure, 
you get a much lower rate of recurrence. So here we're trying to plot, this is the fragility curve which gives the probability of collapse given these uh, particular intensity measures. All right. Okay, so, so if we were to look at the, look at increases in the intensity measures and then we're to, you know, say take increments. These lines represent uh, lambda c is the uh, see, too many of these. lambda c is the probability of collapse. So it's the marrying of these curves, and then we 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 uh, get these different values. So what we're trying to do is. Uh, maybe I'm going back. What we're trying to do in, is t targeting our ground motion now, adjusting the ground motion to match a certain probability of collapse. So f on a probabilistic basis, the new code under S ASC 710 is trying to give us something that gives us a 1% probability of collapse. Now, you know, given that you know, the fragility curve is a general fragility curve. It applies to all buildings. It doesn't necessarily apply to one particular type, but all, everything is the same. So, you know, it, of course, you could always do it yourself. You can come up with your own fragility curve and do your own analysis. It's just like doing bathtub analysis. Right, Farza? So, so this risk targeting, you know, basically the process went through is you pick a, a strength, you get the fragility curve for it, you evaluate the, prob the uh, probability of collapse, and then you adjust it to uh, where you get the target. And we want to have that to be a 1% probability of collapse. And since strength is proportional to uh, pseudo-spectral acceleration, that's the basis of de developing this MCER spectrum. Now, next thing is that the next other thing that got added to uh, uh, the arsenal that we have now is this maximum component of ground motion. I could spend all I could spend the whole hour talking about this, but I won't. Uh, the maximum component. This is a supposed to represent the direction in which the peak response occurs. <coughs> now, you know, it could happen in any direction. Uh, historically, ground motions in, in the ground mo motion prediction equations have always been based upon geomy. You know, just, you know, maybe we've been taking the original, just took the ground motions, whatever, x direction, y direction, whatever it was measured at, and we and then they calculated the ground motions based upon that using a geo mean, you know, taking the uh, geometric mean of, of the results, and not, you know, finding out individually what that maximum di direction component was. And of course, if you're looking at the whole spectrum, this may change directions. It doesn't all occur. It doesn't necessarily always occur in the same direction. Where your PGA might be at north uh, 75 west you're at the, the maximum response at the three second period could be total could be four, 45 degrees off of that or 90 degrees 127 degrees it's it's random it doesn't necessarily all occur in the same direction but we have this concept in there and uh, was put in there for various reasons but uh, we we're stuck with it now so so you know this is probably the consequence of this is we now have probably at least a 20 to 30 percent increase in your design levels for all structures. 20 to 30 percent. Okay, now uh, John wanted to talk about this and how far as I kind of a, a just uh, talked about. It. Now the reason, the reason is if we if we're going to do time history analysis, which we need to have for this nonlinear dynamic analysis, the, uh, 
we're generally using the uh, uniform hazard spectrum as a target for matching. Now, as I mentioned, the uniform hazard spectrum is a, a monster of a spectrum because it includes events of all types, close in, mid-range, far away. And they all have different contributions. The close in event will probably govern the short periods and then fall off when you get to the uh, long periods. The distant event is probably going to be strong at the long periods and weak at the shorter periods. So the concept here is in, in looking at it of a, it's two concepts. One is a conditional mean spectrum developed uh, first by Jack Baker and then later uh, Baker and his students also came, and others, came up with the concept of conditional spectrum. Now, the, on, the idea of a conditional mean spectrum is there's a process in which you, you, you want to look at, here is the uniform hazard spectrum, this that's dashed line. But let's say, you know, we have a building that has certain periods. Let's say it has here, take this, uh, can't find a cursor here at 2.6 seconds let's say that that's our fundamental period so we're gonna match it let's let's find let's uh, take a look at that and then we're going to be you know you, this is a process that's in one of Jack's papers that if we were targeting that particular period what would be the mean spectrum that you would get and that would be this spectrum here you see that it, it would match exactly at 2.6 seconds, and then generally it would fall off from that. It would be lower than the uniform hazard spectrum. And here, you can see a short period, it's like half uh, at that peak. And then, let's say our second period was at 0 0.5, 0 0.85 seconds. And then if we, the conditional mean spectrum would be at that, at that place. And then here, at, let's say here's maybe the third period at 0.45 seconds. And what you would do is you would use a, like a family of these different spectra. Uh, you know, you would do maybe an analysis of, at, in the LA tall buildings, say if we were using the first two periods, we would do, we would take seven time histories that would sort of mimic the conditional mean spectrum at 2.6 seconds, and then another seven at 0.85 seconds. Now, what was the, the so that's the concept there. Then we also have the concept here uh, for conditional spectrum, not without the M now, is considering what the dispersion is. Because if you match at one period, like here at 2.6, you can get a whole family of records. If you didn't do any, any scaling or modification, these records would be all over the place. You can see here, uh, high and low, high and low. So it's all over the place. But you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to match the mean and you're trying to get a suite of records that sort of give you a, a uh, say with, within these type of uncertainty, uh, these uh, probability bounds. That, that would be plus and minus one standard deviation. Now, what's the motivation? The motivation for doing this type of analysis would be that you would get spectra that are more physically meaningful because if you're trying to match the response for the long period, you're actually using records that represent long period ground motions. You're not taking that long period ground motion now and then jacking it up at short periods with a lot of unnecessary frequency or that doesn't physically exist. So, so that's the first reason. The other thing is it's easier then to find more compatible time series because you can actually find records that might match that type of event instead of something that does, doesn't really exist. Okay, the current implementation. All right, basically both PEER and LATB SDC followed, used the ASC 710 to define the MCER ground motions. And that's a 1% probability of collapse in 50 years. And uh, the, where we start from is the 2% probability of exceedance in 50 year, which is the old MCE. And, uh, and then we're, we're, mo we're gonna modify that. So we will develop the uh, 
pseudo-spectral acceleration over the period range of interest. And uh, the ASC 7 in Chapter 11 gives us the standard code spectrum approach. And I've seen some, uh, some people actually use this in some, some peer reviews, not very, not very often, but they have used the standard code spectrum. But more often, and I think probably better, with the, the use of a site-specific analysis. Okay, when you do the site-specific analysis, you know, we come up with the MCE that we would, or that we have traditionally done with the 2% probability in 50 years. And then we have to apply the risk targeting factors and the maximum component factors, check for the deterministic cap, and then from that we have the MCE spectrum. Then from that, if you need it, you can develop the design spectrum, the code design spectrum. And then, then after that comes the acceleration, time history selection, and scaling. Uh, you know, the, as far as I've mentioned, the scaling, uh, you know, some people like to just take existing records and just scale up and down. That's not real easy to do because it's hard to find records that have really compatible shapes with a uniform hazard spectrum. Because in general, if you're going to try to match it, probably it's going to be really wild. It will not look anything like uh, what you would have in reality because you're, you're scaling up or down to some, some other value. And then you need a suite, and then, you, then you're trying to get suites, and you may have to do a goodness of fit and try to do, minimize the errors, and then trying to get them to, to fall within a certain range that might be within, say, the, uh, uh, say, one or plus or minus one standard deviation. It looks something reasonable. It's not real easy. But it can be done, and it has been done. Okay. All right. So I'm. I'm really. I think I'm going to skip through the code well, real fast. You know, you, we. You know, the code is really. is is based upon a lot of assumptions. Uh, you get the s. The SS and S1 are based upon 760 meters per second, which is the BC boundary. So it's way up there. It's not. You know, we have very few buildings in this part of the world that have that type of VS30. And then the code uses adjustment factors, amplification factors for the different site classes. Since it's really, you know, close to, uh, close to BC, uh, these are the factors. Now, FA and FV depend on VS30. And then here's the question that always comes up is, do you measure from ground surface, from the foundation depth, or some intermediate depth? This is something that's not addressed in the code. And uh, there are a lot of different answers. OK, I'll first, first say that common practice, I've seen, I've seen it done from all over. I've seen it from the ground surface. I've seen it from the base of the structure. I've seen it from some intermediate depth. Now, John argues that you should do, do it from the ground surface and then use soil structure interaction. Okay. You, we know nobody uses soil structure interaction, or very few. It's only on very limited number of projects. I think, you know, all the years I've been working on this, I think I've only maybe about three or four projects have used soil structure interaction. And that's only because someone, someone had a particular idea in mind that they had to do it a certain way. And it cost a lot of money, a lot of time. But you know, for most projects we know that we have, as Ron mentioned, you know, we're working for developers and all they're interested is getting a project up. As, uh, basically he says they want to do it cheap, so they're not going to pay for a lot of extra significant things that we might think of value, but they might not think so. You know, some projects are, are worth that, but most projects, generally, most of the developers don't think so. In fact, you know, they're kind of looking at, uh, you know, 
if you do performance-based design, am I going to get a cheaper building? I guess that's a question I can't answer, but maybe some people here can. But in terms of uh, this issue, you know, uh, you know, it's it's not a simple issue to deal with because, you know, we've got projects like the project Len is going to talk about later today. We've got one building, and what that building probably occupies the floor print the. The footprint of the building probably occupies 5% or less of the total air, uh, area of the, built, of the uh, basement. So, you know, we're excavating a whole city, a huge city block. Actually, it's one of the biggest blocks in downtown Los Angeles. It's probably the size of two or three blocks. So you're excavating a lot of material. So, you know, so if you're looking at the ground surface, and then where are you taking the ground surface? We actually have a big difference in grade across that site. So, you know, John says use it at the ground surface. And then we have different conditions. The stuff at the, at the surface, it might be alluvium, and then you might have the building actually founded in bedrock. So, you know, what is appropriate? So, you know, I think the practice, the most of the practice I've seen really has been more toward using the calculating the VS30 from the base. Now, John has some legitimate concerns. You know, I think it may be more, what look, we have to look at the scale of the project. If you're looking at, okay, in San Francisco here, you don't have much room, we're gonna tear down the building across the street, well, it's a postage stamp size. Maybe it makes a difference there. But if we were gonna, say, do a big block, then we're really excavating way down, and, and I think we have to look at it. And then a lot of these projects are very, very deep. You know, parking is precious, and we have to go down to get it. So, you know, we're getting projects that are maybe 60, 70. One project we have now is almost uh, 90 feet deep. 90 feet. So there's a lot of difference in that. Okay, now. So, okay, get off my soapbox. Okay, so the standard implementation is, you know, you know the code process we have to go through and uh, modify it to, and here's the spectral shape, and you'll notice that uh, at long periods, uh, we, can, we can drop it off at one over T squared, and then the TL is a value that's given in the code. And, you know, that can be problematic at long periods because it doesn't necessarily descend in fact, this whole part here, this doesn't necessarily descend at 1 over t, and this doesn't necessarily descend at 1 over t squared. You know, th this is kind of like assumed, this part is assumed to be like, kind of like the constant velocity area, and then down here, where over t 1 over t squared is like a constant displacement. Okay, so, so site specific, the the methods that we have for doing the seismic hazard analysis and doing uniform hazard spectrum, generally the uh, attenuation relationships that we have only cover up to 10 seconds. They don't go beyond 10 seconds right now. Even NGA West 2 doesn't go beyond 10 seconds. Now, we may need to extend that because I have a building now that we're doing and the uh, building period is nine seconds. So we have to have a spectrum and time histories that are compatible out to about 13 and a half. So really, we need to look at the spectrum way beyond that. Okay, so we, we're using 2% probability of cities in 50 years, and uh, okay, let's get that. Okay, the benefits of doing site-specific analysis, well, one, we, it's, you know, rather than using the code approach, is there's no interpolation. When we're doing the code approach, you know, you look at the maps in the code, you can't read them, it's too small. That's because they want you to go to the USGS impl uh, implementation on their web tool. And, but even that, it's not site specific because it's, a, on a, it's for a grid. And what they're doing is interpolation based upon the grid. It may not necessarily give you a, a good representation of your local site conditions, particularly if you have uh, a place where you might have bedrock that's, that's varying in depth. And of course, 
using site specific is more robust to the site factors and uh, and the spectrum would be probably more valid at long periods and that's important for tall buildings okay now the risk targeting factors these are I just picked a site in down in the downtown areas of these four locations uh, best that I could and you can see that in terms of the risk targeting factor here in the West, uh, it's gives, it has some effect. It's actually in LA, San Diego, and Seattle, we get a little bit of benefit, might give us some slight reduction. In San Francisco, about, you're about even. In other parts of the country, it might be really, much be, might be higher, and many places also much lower. Now, the, the the uh, max component factors that are in the in ASC 7 tells you that we should increase the increase the uh, the geo mean uh, geo mean spectral acceleration at at uh, 0.2 seconds by a factor of 1.1, and then at uh, one second and beyond use 1.3. Now this is from Shahi and Baker, and, and you see it in the uh, earthquake spectra, and they show very clearly that that 1.1 is too low. It should be 1.2. And this is something that uh, we've been bringing up in peer reviews and, and the uh, people doing ground motions have been agreeing with us. So it should be 1.2 at, uh, at the shorter periods. So now, you know, really, the ground motion, that's why I talked about earlier, the ground motions have increased by 20 to 30 percent. Okay. We check the terroristic cap. All right, I think I can skip all this. Um, um, these are just talking about how to do, check the deterministic cap, and that that would that's just very easy to do. So the design spectrum, two thirds at MCE. Uh, that's not required. Okay, let's look at time history analysis because this is really the crux of the matter for doing tall buildings. Because you, you need it to, to in order to do the do the collapse analysis or the the, the one percent probability of exceedance. There's little guidance in ASC 710. There's maybe a little bit more guidance in ASC 4113 on on uh, how to do the analysis. But basically, uh, the requirements of three, for the 3D analysis says that the SRSS of each selected motion should be greater than the MCER for the period range from 0.2 to 1.5 times the fundamental period. So that's our period range of interest. And there are special requirements when you are near fault sites, which when you're within five kilometers of a fault. And there's no commentary in ASC 710 on how you match, whether you do a direct scaling, scaling up and down, or spectral matching. It's silent on that. So what are the problems that we have in, in matching time histories? There's a confusion over the use of the SRSS now that we have the maximum component motions. What are the alternatives? Do we match both components to the MCER? Do we match one component to the MCER and one to the geo mean spectrum? And even, even if both are matched to the geo mean spectrum, the SRSS will, will exceed the MCER. Is, is that really in, the intention? Okay, let's take a look at what might happen. Okay, here is the MCER in red. This is for a hypothetical site. So, and this is normalized. Spect, uh, spectral acceleration divided by the PGA for the MCER. Okay, and then when I did this plot, this was actually before Shahi and Baker, so it has the 1.1 factor for maximum direction at 0.2 seconds. So if you did if you did if you did that correction, the MCR would go up a little, uh, by a little, less than 10 percent at the short periods, but at long periods it's still the same. Okay, so uh, this line here, which is the Okay, the top line is what happens when you match both components to the MCER. 
you can see that we are much higher, much higher than the MCR spectrum. You know, when you're taking the SRSS, it's much higher. If you're matching one component to the MCER and the other to the geomean, that's this green line. And if you match both components of the geomean, that's this third line, which is the thin gray line. Now, this is the way that it would have been under the old code, is this, this line here, the third line. And, I, and I, you know, I've talked with Ron Hamburger and I've talked with other people that this was the intention, this was the intention that using the MCR was not going to change the way that you were going to find time histories. However, the plot thickens, and I'll get to that. But you know, this is the way that I think it should be done, and I, in talking with Ron, it's the way that he thinks it should be done. Now, at least, at least that's the way he, at least when did we talk about that, Morris Harzad? Last April. We talked about it last April, and I have a, uh, we, have, we have emails to prove it. <laughs> okay. So based upon our discussions with Ron Hamburger, that's why we have these two, two statements in the LATB SDC commentary. If geo mean spectra are used, the target SRSS spectrum should be taken as 130% of the risk targeted MCE geo mean spectrum. If the maximum direction spectra are used, the target SRSS spectrum should be taken taken as 100% of the risk-targeted MCE geo mean spectrum. So, so that came from Ron. So obviously Ron at that point in time, last April, beginning of April 2014, did not think that we needed to match the MCER in all, both directions. Okay, now the process, uh, serviceability, this is a, a, a smaller ground motion, 50% probability of being exceeded in 30 years. You do not need to apply risk targeting factors or maximum component factors. And the match time histories are only required if you're gonna do a response history analysis because you can't just do a, a regular analysis with it. Okay, what are, th okay, now here comes the zinger. What are the proposed changes in the future? From the NEHRP recommendations that are, I guess, coming out next year. You're gonna perform the assessment at, at the MCER level, not at two-thirds the MCER level. No, there will be no more design earthquake. We don't use that two-thirds anymore. Also, the MCER or the scenario spectra are allowed as targets. You'll drop the SRSS scaling criteria. Instead, you'll compute the max component spectrum for a given direction. And then each ground motion is scaled, which means identical scaling for all components, such that the average of the maximum direction spectra from all ground motions matches the target. So they are requiring, in 2015 NEHR, that upper line, the upper line. So now what's happened to you, what's happened to your design? You're now designing for, you know, if you're looking at the spectrum, you look, you're designing for spectral values that are much higher than, than even the MCER before. Now, you know, this is, I would say, call, Call Barack Obama, call Senator Feinstein, call Senator Boxer, do something about it. You know, this is running amok. I had a I had a conversation with Jack Baker, and he said, "Well, Jack says, well, you know, it's, that's the way it is. That's what they voted. Can't we do something about it? this? Doesn't make sense to me, to be honest with you. It really pains me. I think this is wrong. You know, I think when we brought in maximum direction, I th it was wrong then." And now what we're doing is we're not correcting it, we're compounding it. This is wrong. You know, in, a, in a sense, you know, this may kill performance-based earthquake engineering design because what is the benefit of doing it? 
what's the benefit of doing it? You're not getting any benefit in, in having good ground motions because you're not getting good ground motions. Right, John? <laughs> no, no, no comment. No response. Non-responsive. Okay. All right. And then also the, the matching range is now from T min to two times T, where T min captures 90% mass participation. Okay. What else? And it'll be required a minimum of 11 ground motion pairs, which is not not really a bad idea since. Uh, since more is better. And spectral matching, I already mentioned that. Motions applied, okay. All right, so in summary, and then I think these things were written before I found out what the changes were, so some of them are not true. Uh, okay, first, spectral analysis is st strongly recommended for tall buildings because it's a better analysis rather than using code values. Uh, the, compared to ASC 705, we have an increase due to largely to the maximum components. Uh, the 3D, this is wrong now. The use of 3D response history analysis procedures in the 2015 NEHRP, add the words in capital letters in red, do not mitigate the problems associated with the maximum component motions. In fact, they will exacerbate exacerbate them. Okay, so now it's not a, uh, and this one, it's not, cross out the word modest. It's a huge penalty for use of spectrum compatible motions instead of directly scaled motion. In fact, it may, you know, I, I kind of look at it, what's the reasoning behind it? It's probably the reason behind it is someone f trying to make everybody use either conditional mean or conditional spectra, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but is this the right way to do it? You know, it's kind of forcing you to do that, to use conditional mean or conditional mean spectra. Okay, it, you know, under current conditions, you know, I thought that, you know, the way that we were, we thought we could match we, using uh, performance-based design, you could actually get some break in your design forces and your, you know, th that the demands are actually less than you would if you did a straight you know, code approach. Okay, all right. Okay, so I talked uh, 45 minutes on what I'm supposed to do in 30. So now, let me see if I can, what I can do on source structure interaction. But source structure interaction, Having gone through this a few times, you know, as far as I'd mentioned, the benefits for tall buildings are rather limited. But you know, for short, short period buildings, it can be beneficial. Okay, so talking about build here, we just get into it. So, what are the required inputs for doing soil structure interaction? We really need need to have good geotechnical and geophysical investigation. So we need, and it gives us flexibility and damping at the foundations on likely to, to affect the first mode of tall buildings. It might, it might be beneficial at some of the longer periods. And uh, generally for, for periods, less than one second is where we begin to see some benefit. So the required uh, soil properties, so we generally would like to see good geotechnical investigation, which has uh, good quality borings, good samples so that we can identify the materials. And it's very helpful to have uh, shear wave velocities because we, the properties are gonna be based upon shear modulus and then we can get the, the shear wave velocities to get the shear modulus. And, and it may be better to uh, have it at uh, several places on the site rather than just having a single determination but uh, economics may govern that. And we need to really define it. You know, if, if you were doing one to get the VS30, you probably have it, it's probably sufficient detail. But if you were just doing it just to look for localized, looking at a foundation, you probably need to at least 
figure out what depth of influence that the soil, soil materials influence that particular foundation. But usually VS30 would work, you know, unless you had an extremely deep building, then maybe you need to go deeper. You need to determine the soil shear strength and use the undrained strength below groundwater and determine the Poisson's ratio, which we can get from the, uh, from the uh, ratio of the P waves to the S wave velocities above the groundwater. Can't use it below the groundwater because the P wave velocity is going to be the P wave velocity of water at 5,000 feet per second approximately. And also have to consider hysteretic damping. Of course, damping, uh, if, we, if we cycle a soil, with more and more cycles, the, it begins to bend, <coughs> the stresses drop and increase strain, and we get more energy dissipated, which is the, uh, the area inside uh, these loops. Okay, static stiffness, and all these are in, in the paper, and you know, these are uh, in the notes, and you'll find them in many, many places, and the, the reference that you should really look at is the NIST report that's referenced in here. 2012 that uh, John Stewart worked on uh, with, with others. So for translation, you can see here it's a, the, for uh, the horizontal stiffness K equal to the shear modulus G, and this is a shear modulus that, say for static, then it would be at the, for G for low strain times B and times a function of the Poisson's ratio and the B ratio and then the B over L which is the uh, width and length ratio. Rotation GB cubed times a, a function. And then we also have embedment modifiers, <coughs> ADAs, which are also a function of the depth to width and then, uh, and then the aspect ratio of the uh, foundation. Then there are dynamic modifiers, and, and then we also have radiation damping modifiers. So these are all described in the uh, report by John. Now, distributed springs, here you, know, you, you find that these are, probably seen these before. Uh, the, the, the equations that you have here are all found in this NIST report, but uh, what you would need, you know, if you had a mat foundation or large spread footings, then you can put a distributed spring under it. And then really the springs, also, these type, of, since they're vertical springs, they'll, and actually some of the horizontals, also allow you to model for rotation uh, of the structure. And you know, there can be some benefits from that. Okay. Now you can use, and then uh, th this is ba basically, you know, what, what I guess from a, uh, for embedded foundations, this is, I guess, considered to be probably the best way to model it. However, I don't think we really have the, the uh, electronic power to do this very efficiently unless you're working with uh, some really specialized models, the type that they would use in the, in the uh, nuclear industry. But I think a lot of the dynamic analysis software that we have for structures now, we're not capable of doing this efficiently. Um, and I, as far as I, you tried this, right? It didn't work too well? Or, or it's too much effort? It's too much work. Too much work. You can't get it to work, but it's too much work. Okay, so maybe you know when, uh, maybe when uh, Apple comes out with a 50, 50 gigahertz model, maybe we can do it. Okay, so and okay, so you get spring stiffness, but you also have limiting values. In the vertical direction, it's going to be based on the bearing capacity, and it's an ulti the ultimate bearing capacity, not a uh, pressure limit that we you know generally geotechnicals come up with. Uh, bearing capacity is sometimes based upon limitation of settlement. It's not based upon that. It's based upon actual strength. So we need to know what the ultimate bearing capacity is because that tells you what the maximum, uh, what the the ma maximum 
force that we can put into a spring. And horizontal directions, and that's going to be limited by your base friction or passive or some combination which you might think is appropriate. And these <coughs> analysis should use, utilize the shear strength, again, not based upon limiting displacements. Okay, kinematic effects. Kinematic interaction, and sometimes this is where some people try to use it, uh, but uh, for tall buildings it may have limited, limited benefit. And there are two parts of the kinematic interaction, which would be base slab averaging, and the other one dealing with foundation embedment. Okay, and these are expressed as transfer functions, so it makes the analysis a little bit more complicated. So it's in the frequency domain. Oops. All right, so the physical basis for base lab averaging. Here we're looking at, this is a, this is a research site that's down in the Borrego Valley, and there's an array of, of instruments here. You can see here it's in an array from station A, main station, up to station E. And you can see the main station, and then A was 10 meters away, and then the distance doubles up to E was 160 meters away. And then here you can see what the, the time, this is one direction, I'm not sure what the orientation was, but a plot of the uh, ground motions away from that main station. And you can see that they're not identical, even though they're within 160 meters of each other. That even the, you know, there's some of them that are, look pretty close, but even then, there's a little bit of shift in terms of amplitude and also a shift in terms of frequency content. So physical, the basis for base lab averaging, if we're looking at the, at the plan view of it, and then uh, if we're looking at the ground motions at two places, adjacent places, UG1, UG2, you know, even on the ground surface, that you take two points. Here's what the, the, if you took the Fourier amplitude, got the Fourier spectra, you see that uh, here's, this is based upon log of frequency, that at low frequencies, they pretty much track together, but at, at higher frequencies, they begin to diverge. And you know, they're probably both wiggling around. And in terms of you, uh, looking at the phase change, you get phase changes that relatively they're, they're in sync at, <coughs> at the low frequencies, and then at high frequencies, it really jumps around, that they're getting out of phase. So sp spatial variability is strongly frequency dependent. So if, if we're looking at the, uh, here, the foundation and plan, and then, you know, like taking, uh, looking at uh, ground motions and how it moves, we see that in low frequency components, the, if you're looking at the low frequency components, it pretty much tracks <coughs> the motions at this point here, similar to the motions here, nearly identical. So the foundation, at that, the found, uh, foundation displacement at that frequency is equal to the ground displacement. Now what happens when we're looking at the high frequency components? Now it's beginning to get more jumbled. It doesn't, it's not identical anymore. So the foundation ground motion is going to be less, at that frequency, less than the, uh, the motions in the, free f in the free field. And then physical basis for embedment. We have low frequency, for the low frequency, we have a long wavelength. So ground motions, Ground motions are the same and you don't get rotation. At high frequencies, <coughs> you have short wavelengths, and then there you can get the foundation move mo uh, motion is going to be less than, the less than the ground, and there's going to be a possibility of some rotation. So there are various ways of doing it. There's like taking wave passage, assuming that, and this really wave passage may be more important where you have a large foundation where you know, it takes time for the wave to pass, so you're getting some incoherency in the ar arriving waves. But you can use codes like SASE 
and then you can, uh, based upon incoherency and you based upon this kappa factor which is given here, based on the shear wave velocity, you can see that you might get some, here's a function here, you know, what you might get in terms of uh, some reductions. So these are semi-empirical and then um, models for rigid cylinders. I'm out of time. This is uh, what you get you're based upon the depth. The more depth you get, the more, more value. And then these are given in terms of ratio of response spectra. So, so you can get this, and this is all given in the, uh, in, in the NIST report. We don't have all the details in the notes. So you're referred to the NIST report, which was 2012. And it's this report here. You can actually go online. Just type in NIST 917-21 and you get you can get the PDF and download it. So you know, it's a good cure for insomnia. <laughs> Here's an example of foundation free field ground motions. This is the Rancho Cucamonga Law and Justice Center, and this is from the Whittier Narrows earthquake in 1987. And I was involved with that one, and I remember it was a real. It was the first, first building in the U.S. to be base isolated. So 1987 was just right after the building opened, and there, there was a free field station, and then there's a, a, an accelerometer at the, below the isolated level on, on the ground, underneath the building. And here, you can see, here's the time series, of the ground motions, the free field, UG, and then the foundation, which is the, underneath the building, so red, you can see the big difference, particularly uh, we don't have as high accelerations. But not a big ground motion at that site. Here's how the frequency content is. And here's, if you're looking at the uh, spectral acceleration, this is what the ground motions look like. Spectral acceleration of the ground. Here's the spectral acceleration of the foundation. And uh, you can see here that in terms of short periods, high frequencies, there's certainly reduction. At long periods, it's about, you know, very close to one. So that's one of the arguments that, you know, for long periods, it doesn't really give you any benefit because you're not getting any reduction. So at short periods, you do get some reduction in the response. So, you know, for tall buildings, if you're, you know, we're talking about John Hooper's un unknown, unnamed tower, it's too big. You really don't benefit from it, at least not in terms of your fundamental period. And besides, if you do that, you probably can't use the model that you, you're using in terms of taking a fixed base. You probably, probably peer review will force you to put in some springs underneath, which is more of a even more complicated in terms of your modeling. So, anyway, I think I'm going to skip that since we're right at 11 o'clock. So, thank you very much. <laughs>